When you take a stop and look and see crazy things in this black history across the ocean and across the sea now is the time to be free hello and welcome to the final chapter of africa the black me story part five where we will continue to dig down trying to get behind the real story of how we got from our original position of magnificence, living naturally in a state of peace, love and relative prosperity, to our present position where even today, we continue to struggle and strive for equal rights and justice in this modern world, which seems unable to accept that the African black person could also be capable of achieving the developmental greatness. Before we continue to go through our black me story, I'd just like to quickly recap what we discussed in part four. So you can see highlighted in red the two sections or chapters that we covered in part four. The first of these chapters was Arab influence, where we looked at how significant Arab presence on the African continent began with the settling of Sumo scores with the Byzantine Empire still in control across North Africa and then progressing into the Saharan and Nilitic regions and along the East Coast, driven by profitable trading opportunities, including for slaves and their desire to spread their new religion of Islam. The second highlighted chapter on is on uh, European contact and concentrates on how the now Christianized Europeans gradually reacquainted itself with an Africa which it had no real knowledge of other than through pillaged histories and mythical tales. Before beginning to work their way down the west coast in search of a route to India and becoming engulfed in slave trading which was exploited for sale on the slave markets of the Americas from ports on both the east and the west coast for close to 400 years. We looked at how within a few decades the European scramble for Africa would begin seeing them carve up the whole continent for control amongst themselves to enable their exploitation of its people and natural resources before finally beginning to loosen the chains of colonialization towards the end of the 1950s. In this chapter, we look at the independence that existed on the continent from the start of the second millennium CE through to present times, functioning beyond the reach of the foreign invaders and religious colonialisers who had taken control in the various regions across northern Africa from east to west and were also showing a presence along the east coast. By this time, it was in the shape of increased Arab presence and the growth of Islamic faith amongst the people in these locations, which, had, which has already been spoken about in part four of this series. Independence on the rest of the continents would continue from this point pretty much untainted by foreign contact or influence. The most notable effect from foreign contact on independent Africa at the beginning of the second millennium CE was the migratory movements taking place in Western Africa into new territories in the forest to avoid forced conversion or capture into slavery. This time the movement taking place was uh, towards modern day Liberia and Sierra Leone as demonstrated by the arrows on this map with further movement in southern Togo towards modern-day Benin. 
some of the independent Africans in West Africa would group together and hold their ground against Muslim conversion, as can be seen with the establishment and growth of the Soso Kingdom in modern day Guinea, uh, where they migrated to as the uh, Ghana Empire began to decline, indicated with the red dot on this map uh, towards the west. The dismantling of the Ghana Empire would be complete in the early 1200s with the emergence of the Mali Empire still in its pre-Islamic era of leadership. On the eastern side of the continent, Ethiopia, conscious of the growing uh, Muslim presence in most of its surrounding territories, sought to make an alliance with the European Crusaders who they considered to be their Christian compatriots as they engaged in their war against the Muslims located in Jerusalem. The kings returned to Ethiopia after the failed attempt by the Crusaders to take Jerusalem, saw him develop a religious site at Lalibela based on his vision of the holy city. As the Mali Empire expanded in the west, it also became more acquainted with Islam and its wealthy emperor Mansa Musa would convert to the faith, making his famous pilgrimage to Mecca in the 1300s. Its expansion into the north of modern day Ivory Coast would lead to social discord there and mass migration into the southern parts of the modern territory. Further south on the west coast, around the location of modern day Congo and Angola, the Kingdom of Congo was being established as neighbouring territories began entering peaceful pacts of cooperation and unity. Whilst further to the east, in modern day territory of Uganda, two distinct sects of people would develop within the Bunyoro society established there, with the agriculturalists, who were settled farmers known as Hutus on one side, and the pastoralists, who were semi-nomadic warriors, uh, referred to in modern times as Tutsis on the other. The system developed there favoured the Tutsis who with their military strength were able to take up leadership roles in, the, in their society causing a division amongst the people that would see the establishment of the Buganda Kingdom further south and a steady stream of migration into their territory by Hutus. Further breakaways from the Bunyoro Kingdom would see in the following century the establishment of the Kingdom of Rwanda in the modern day country of the same name. In southern Africa, conditions of climate change brought about the abandonment of the most dominant state in that part of the, com of the continent, the Kingdom of Mapungubwe leaving a void that would be eventually filled around 1430 by the massive Mutapa Empire who would exercise its rule over most of southern Africa. Coming into the end of the 14th century, the Mali Empire had been replaced by the Songhai Empire, whose firmer stance caused further social discourse within modern Ivory Coast territory again, causing mass migration further south into the dense forest. Ethiopia out in the east, fearing the continuing growth of Islam all around it, sent a delegation of diplomats to Europe to appeal for support in defense of its territory against invasion from the, from the Muslim enemy. The European response to them was more to see them as a curiosity rather than to take seriously their pleas for help. The Kotoko Kingdom was another state formed through the unification of neighbouring territories to strengthen their trading and military capabilities, as we uh, can see indicated on the red dot on this map. Uh, and they were successful in claiming territory formerly held by the Seoul civilization, uh, which was an Islamized uh, civilization, 
uh, based in modern day Cameroon and northern Nigeria. Uh, which uh, the uh, Kotoko were successful in taking during the mid 15th century. Going into the second half of the 15th century, uh, the Akan people, sensing a greater need to protect their secret locations of their gold mines, re relocated deeper into the forest land uh, of what is now modern day uh, country of Ghana. Internal conflicts within the Ashanti Confederation was see an Akan grouping known as the Abron migrate into territory in modern day Ivory Coast. By this time, West Africa was not only being affected by the Islamic activity taking place throughout the region, but they were also beginning to see the presence of European traders on the coast. These two foreign entities would be engaged in what seemed to be a competition to see who could capture the most African slaves for sale on their inhumane markets. At the end of the 15th century, early European slave trafficking activity in Tanzania drove a significant wave of migrants into the, at the time, uninhabited uh, location of modern-day Burundi. Whilst in what is now the Central African Republic, slave raids were taking place to service the Arab slave markets, which in both cases had Africans playing a major part in the capture of these prisoners. In the Mandoria uh, mountains in Cameroon, a new kingdom had been formed with the intention of joining with its neighboring territories to take a firm stance for African traditionalism and strengthening its ability to defend against uh, foreign intrusion. Within a hundred years, it had been Islamized under the influence of the emerging Bono Empire, who were also successful in bringing an end to the Kotoko Kingdom. With the Portuguese presence well established in the Indian Ocean by the middle of the 16th century, with its slave trafficking activity along the east coast of the African continent, they were able to answer the call from uh, Ethiopia to give them support in their war against the Muslim converts of the adult kingdom of modern day Somalia. After Ethiopia's victory, the Portuguese demanded that the Ethiopian king make a pledge of obedience to Rome, effectively putting Ethiopia under the control of the European powers. Something that the Ethiopians quite rightly would reject unlike what the Kingdom of Congo did uh, decades before when they accepted the Christian faith um, after being converted by the Portuguese. The Ethiopians would cut off all contacts with Europeans for what would turn out to be several centuries as they started to develop positive relationships with some of the local communities of Muslim converts who they encountered as their empire expanded in size and strength. In the West, a decade later, Mane warriors, who were not themselves strictly Muslims, but were at least well equipped to function in that world, began a military campaign in what is now Sierra Leone, in a bid to strengthen their power base and increase trading opportunities. By the end of the 16th century, the Kingdom of Dahomey, in modern day Benin, had been founded on the West African coast. From its inception, being considered by the European slave traffickers as a major centre. Further south, in modern day Angola, the Ndongo Kingdom, who had a long established trade relationship with the Portuguese, had been forced to fend off attempts by their trading partner to control their territory during the mid 17th century. As a result, they decided to switch their trading practices to favour the Dutch, who were at that time a major competitor of the Portuguese in the business of slave trading, particularly to the uh, South American location of Brazil. In modern-day Ghana, 
the Ashanti Confederation was being formed to exploit and gain from the rising European demand for slaves. Coming into the final decades of the 17th century, the Congo Empire, which had already been converted into a Christian state for over a century by then, would see the first black Christian martyr of modern times when Kima Vita, a member of the Congo nobility, was condemned by the Portuguese as being a heretic and a witch for developing and preaching a brand of Christianity that would be considered by today's standards as an early form of Ethiopianism or the, uh, or the black church leaning towards the notion of a black Christ. She would be sentenced by the Portuguese to burn at the stake. By the early 1700s, Slave raids into the present Central African Republic continued, but this time with the purpose of servicing the European slave markets of the Americas. Whilst further south in present-day Burundi, the Kingdom of Burundi was being established by a Tutsi minority who ruled over the Hutsi majority. Towards the mid-1700s, the powerful Oyo Empire, based in present-day Nigeria, entered into a war with the Kingdom of Dahomey, who, despite having smaller numbers militarily, also had the greater number of firearms. The battle would therefore be longer than the Oyo had anticipated, but they would be successful in achieving their victory in the end, reducing Dahomey into a tributary state. Much infighting had begun to occur in the Yorubu and Unri kingdoms of present-day Nigeria around this time, all in relation to the servicing of the coastal slave trading with Europeans. The Aro Confederacy expanded their territory into Western Cameroon, probably in response to the warlike attitudes that had become normalized across the region in Nigeria. Also in present-day Ghana, divisions and pressures within the Ashanti uh, Confederacy, undoubtedly influenced by slave trading activity, drove uh, further waves of migration into the Ivory Coast. Going through into the early part of the 19th century, in present-day South Africa, the powerful Zulu Kingdom came to prominence, under their famous leader, Shaka Zulu. A couple of decades after the famed and respected stance taken by Shaka Zulu, the United States colony of Liberia elected its first non-white governor before declaring its independence a decade later. Although a few European countries recognized their claim of independence immediately, the United States itself would not do so until around 1860. By the end of the 19th century, European leaders had carved up Africa as territories free for them to exploit without resistance. As part of this program of activities on the continent, Italy would invade into Ethiopia around 1890 being defeated in the Battle of Adwa, becoming known as the first time an African nation had gained victory in a war with a European power. Italy would come back for a second goal at taking Ethiopia 50 years later, just before the start of World War II, uh, and again managing to uh, come out of it defeated after a brief period of occupation. At this time, only Ethiopia and Liberia were recognized internationally as independent nations. But after WW2, the onus was on the Western powers to relinquish its grip on all of its colonies. The slow drip of new independent states in Africa would begin in 1951, as is listed here.
yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a rebel, rebel in the morning, rebel in the evening too. I'm a rebel, rebel in the daytime, rebel in the nighttime. I'm a rebel, rebel in the morning, rebel in the evening. But even at this stage, there were signs that the transition into independence for the African nations was not going to be a smooth one. In DR Congo, the elected Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba was deposed, arrested and executed less than a year after being elected after a turbulent few months in power. Belgium, who was a former colonial ruler in DR Congo, were opposed to Lumumba in place, uh, being in place and had accused him of being a communist with links to the Soviet Union and of having anti-white sentiments. Later analysis of evidence related to the case revealed, revealed that the Belgians played a significant part in the Mumba's downpour and execution. A college of general commissioners was installed to run the country in the following year until its political situation could be sorted out. An assassination attempt on the life of President Olympio of Togo in 1961 was being linked to a political opponent who would flee to neighbouring Ghana where they would be welcomed and given automatic asylum. This and incidents such as this would only contribute to the already ill, feel, Ill feelings that existed between Olympio and the Ghanaian leader uh, Kwame Nkrumah due to a dispute over former colonial borderlines. The assassination attempt would not be the last and in January 1963, members of the Togolese military broke into his house and shot him dead. Uh, recognizing history as the first modern day coup d'etat in a former colonial state in Africa. African nations who also uh, gained independence uh, going into the following years from 1961 are shown here. In the case of the Rwandan independence, a condition that would come with it was the abolition of the Tutsi monarchy there. In 1963, Zanzibar was granted its independence, as was Kenya. But in the case of the Kenyans, its independence came too late for it to be invited to attend the first conference in Addis Ababa for the organization of African unity. Togo's situation after the assassination of its president saw its invitation to attend withdrawn. At the time of the first OAU conference in 1963, nearly half of the African continent was still functioning under colonial rule. To summarize, the way that the independence in Africa operated during the second millennium CE one of the first things that is demonstrated is the ease with which neighbouring villages and settlements were able to unite and uh, establishing large, powerful kingdoms and empires to advance greater trading opportunities and defend against slave raiding activities and foreign invasion. A situation that was being faced very much in Western Africa during the first half of the millennium as a result of the growth in the Islamic faith amongst several of the powerful leaders in that part of the continent. This would cause a series of migratory waves of people into the dense, uninhabited forest regions south of the great West African kingdoms and empires that had been forming, growing in wealth and strength through their close relationship with Arab traders operating on the trade routes leading north. 
Some of the new traditionalist kingdoms that were formed put up a fight against the Islamic incursions taking place, but, no, but most of these would eventually become converted to that faith. As the Europeans arrived and began their trading activities around the coasts of both West and East Africa around the end of the 15th century, that, migrat that migratory activity that had been previously confined to the north and West Africa uh, to avoid the slave raids was now taking place in other parts of the continent. A strange phenomenon that occurred as a result of the Europeans' high demand for slave stock in West Africa was that many of the neighboring villages, clans and states began making war with each other, seeking to capture whole communities to sell as slave stock to the Europeans on the coast. As the European slave trafficking activity waned in the 19th century, old rivalries formed throughout that period uh, would continue. Uh, as the Europeans desire to possess the resources and lands of Africa and its scramble for Africa at the end of the century would begin their new policy in relation to it. A grief-filled desire for world dominance that would culminate in the fighting of two world wars and the gradual dissolution of the westernized colonial system. That process of dissolution today in 2022 is still to be completed. history across the ocean and across the sea now is the time to be free no commotion i'm feeling the pain i feel their emotion the love and devotion just like a root potion because i'm a rebel